Thank you, George, for a well-argued and well-timed opening statement. Ash Sarkar, you're up next. Six minutes on the clock is yours. Let me see by a show of hands. Who here has seen the cost of their housing go up in the last 18 months? They have it. Liberalism has failed. I can imagine how I might be caricatured during this debate, but I imagine there are a lot of people here who describe themselves as liberals who believe many of the same things that I do. You believe, like me, in freedom of conscience. You believe, like me, in due process. And maybe you believe in slaying the giants of racism, homophobia, ableism, and sexism. You want to avert the climate crisis. So do I. But hopefully, over the next 90 minutes, what we're going to show you is that the liberalism as espoused by these two gentlemen over here on my right, both literally and politically, is that <laughs> that form of liberalism not only fails to advance those most dearly held values, it actively imperils them. So what are these big questions that liberalism supposedly answers? Well, of course, the Mac Daddy of political questions for the classical liberals of the 18th century was freedom, the freedom to live without arbitrary constraints in a system that balances your freedoms against the rights of others. But if all we did was debate about Hume and Locke and Bentham and all the rest of it, I think it would be kind of boring. So alongside freedom, I would like us to consider inequality and climate change, the two biggest questions of our time. So let's start with inequality. My friend George here was very relaxed about economic inequality, but I'm not. Because here's the thing about unequal societies, they are also unfree societies. To maintain the distinction between those who have and those who have nothing, it takes the violent, coercive power of the state. And the relationship, the relationship between those who own stuff and those who don't own stuff, the people who don't own stuff being extracted from in the form of rent, that is not a relation of free individuals. So let's take, for example, housing. My best mate, who lives around the corner from me, just got hit with a 600 pound hike in his rent. And of course, he's free to reject that. He's free to tell the landlord where to go. He's free to move out, upend his life, quit his job, break up with his girlfriend, leave all his friends and his family who live nearby. He's perfectly free to do all those things. But what kind of freedom is that? The extracting of rent whether it's from tenants like my friend or from the private companies who own our infrastructure, it's dependent on a coercive relation because you need the housing, you need the water, you need the energy, you need the transport. And so when you need and the others have, there is no real competition between landlords or the landlord class in the marketplace. There is only naked class interest. The great defense of neoliberalism, which I'm sure we'll hear, is that it alleviates poverty worldwide. And of course, there's truth in that. But it has also seen the rise of deeply unequal societies lacking in shared purpose and lacking in evenly distributed increases in the standard of living. Right now, tens of thousands of workers in Bangladesh who liberals would have praised themselves for lifting out of poverty in the 1990s are out on strike. Why? Because they want their wages tripled. Why? Because our orgy of consumerism, the thing that makes us feel so free because I can buy one dress with a broken seam or another dress with a broken seam, that is fueled by the engine of exploited labor in the global south. And that, of course, brings me to climate change. Climate change, we should call it the climate crisis because it's, it's, it's a crisis brought about by the rapacious consumption of goods right here in the global north. And if liberalism had the solution to climate change, it would have implemented it already. But instead, like children who are too in hoc to magical thinking that we can't let go of the myth, we just say to ourselves, oh no, business, big business, that's going to innovate ourselves out of extinction. <laughs> but Shell spends 14 times more on shareholder payouts, six times more on oil and gas than it does on renewables, and I'm sure that invisible hand of the market is going to pop up any time now. A political system that has allowed the plunder of the Earth's resources at the expense of its future, I don't think we can consider that system free, because we will not be free 
on a four degree planet. We will not be free on a planet where millions of people die so that oil shareholders can stay rich. So when we get to it, there's only really one freedom that's truly sacrosanct to these liberals. Everything else is up for discussion. It's the freedom to hoard wealth and to hoard resources, and it takes violence to not only maintain that kind of inequality, it takes violence to turn things into property. Once upon a time, the land of Canada was not property. The land of Canada, it was under the custodianship and the, steward the stewardship of indigenous people. And to talk about them owning the land would sound as ridiculous to them as it would to you to talk about owning the stars above your head. But property, this land was turned into property because of gunpowder and germs. It took violence to introduce a market society into this place, and that's not just the barbarism of the past. It takes violence to sustain a market society today. So please, I implore you, vote against this motion. It would make my day. <laughs>